Friday. Welcome back. Thank you lunch wasn't too short. Um, it's a great pleasure to um, introduce David DeBosa, who will be chairing uh, the next panel. Uh, David will explain a little bit about the format of the uh, panel. Um, David is a reader in museology at the University of the Arts of London. Um, he's the co-author of Post-Critical Museology, Theory and Practice in the Art Museum. Um, other published works uh, on museum culture include Fugitive Direction, Reflections in the Troper Museum, and Engaging uh, Reciprocity, Exhausting Critique, Countering Spectacle. Uh, David trained as a curator uh, after receiving his de uh, degree from Girton College at Cambridge um, and awarded his PhD uh, in art history from Goldsmiths. Um, during the 90s, he curated public art projects. He was senior lecturer at Fine Art Theory at Wimbledon um, from 2004 to 8, and he remains at UAL, uh, where he is currently reader in museology uh, with responsibility in leading the MA in curating and collections. Um, and of course, is a co investigator um, on the AHRC project, Black Artists and Modernism. Uh, thank you so much, David. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for that introduction. Um, and my thanks, of course, go also to um, your co-conveners, to uh, Susan and to Sophie for the organisation of this conference, um, which I'm sure you'll already be feeling the heat as I have, as, as the days have been going by. Um, and of course, thanks to uh, Jantine and to Ron here and the rest of the team at the Van Aber, um for helping get me here anyway, in, in, in one piece. And, uh, for feeding me to the uh, standards to which I often demand. Um, speaking of food, usually, you know, uh, for conference goers, uh, will know that this is usually known as the graveyard slot um, because people have usually come from a very healthy lunch uh, and perhaps have had quite as much coffee or something stronger to help get them through the rest of the afternoon. So uh, to avoid anybody uh, falling into their laptops, what we're going to do is we're going to change the format a little bit this afternoon ladies and gentlemen. We're changing the format. We're not going to deliver uh, papers as uh, conventionally one would do in the, in the afternoon session. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to speak to one of the challenges, which is at the heart of the Black Artists and Modernism Research Project. And that challenge, as we've spoken about over these past couple of days, is to speak directly from the work. The idea is not to speak about the work, and to bring forward a whole set of well-rehearsed socio-political frameworks. The idea is to start from the work and start with observations about the work in order to bring forward issues like materiality and to ask ourselves about the kinds of, if you like, the kind of formal approaches that we may take in terms of looking at the work. So to, fac to facilitate that, we will be uh, in a moment asking, uh, uh, asking ourselves to have a look for 10 minutes or so, five minutes or so, to have a look at the, uh, the film Steps uh, by Stanley Brown from 1988 to 89. Uh, and after that, we will develop strands of conversation and dialogue with our three invited guest speakers this afternoon. And from that, hopefully, <coughs> we will open up a whole series of points of discussion with you um, this afternoon. So uh, leave it now to me just to introduce then those, uh, those speakers uh, who are welcome to the stage to um, join in our uh, conversation. Uh, first of all, I start with uh, Ellen Bice. Um, whom I had the um, great pleasure to uh, meet uh, very recently. Um, and I've known that Ella has worked, Ellen has worked for some time now, both in the Netherlands, in the Dutch context, <coughs> having been a researcher at Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht, but also has worked on the other side of the Atlantic now with her PhD candidacy in the University of California, uh, Berkeley. Uh, she has um, written on uh, a number of matters, including the work of a figure that many of you will know, Wendelin van Oldenburg, who represented the Netherlands at the Venice Biennale uh, earlier this year. And she, her recent essays, as you will know, have um, appeared as White Paper on Land, Law and the Imaginary, and on Wendelin van Oldenburg, Cinema Orlando. So I'd like to welcome... Uh, 
add them to the stage. Okay, um, I also welcome someone with whom I've had the pleasure to work over a number of years now. Um, some of, many of you in the room will know Charles Langfund and his work. Um, I met up and uh, have worked in Charles, with Charles in relation to uh, his work here in the Netherlands and understanding the significance of his voice here. He's a visual artist and more lastly I've known him as a, as a curator and he's currently researching the visual strategies of Dutch Afro artists with a focus on the production of cultural citizenship. He's also a PhD candidate at uh, the Royal College of Art in London and he's um, in the programme of curating and contemporary art. So I'd like to welcome Charles to the stage. And last by no means least, a person with whom I have the great pleasure to share something of an intellectual path and uh, a bit of a, a, a journey in relation to many of the thoughts that we're discussing here uh, over these days. Um, I know Sophie Orlando not only as a, a first class mind, but also someone who has a deep commitment to the issues that we're talking about today. And I'm delighted that much of her commitment has come to a fruition with her appointment as Associate Professor of Theory and Contemporary Art History at the National Art School at the Villa Arson in Nice, France. And Sophie's work, an, an excellent book, if I don't say so myself, because I reviewed it, um, <laughs> which is a, a, a brilliant publication, which I actually have seen in the, uh, in the, uh, the bookshop here, uh, British Black Art Debates on Western Art History. And she uh, is also editor of a book, um, I think forthcoming, about to be forthcoming, just, just coming out. Just release it, pop the press, you see. You hear it here first. Um, the title, Sonia Voice, Thoughtful, Disobedient. So let's welcome Sophie Jensen. Thank you. Okay, so with your permission, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have um, just a few minutes of the film for those of you who weren't able to catch it during the break. Just about five minutes, uh, and then we'll go into, into discussion. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything, big. <laughs> if we are, we just to yeah. yeah, maybe it's a bit strange for people to look at you looking at the screen. <laughs> Particularly because in looking at the work, uh, I uh, saw the, the spaces like the Rue Saint Martin, the, the steps, the Hundred Steps, and the Boulevard Sebastopol, and these spaces which immediately made me think about this whole discussion about the flaneur, the, the, the wanderer through, through, through the city streets, through the urban landscape. But I did think that within the work, there was a sense in which this is flannery, but without the flaneur. I was constantly asking myself, where is, where is the planner? Can I see the planner? Who is this planner? And the whole sense of the, the, the personality of the planner seems somehow to be absent or absented or evacuated from, from the work. So I wanted to start up that and just maybe get some, some comments around that, this question about absenting or, or evacuating the work. Okay. Um, I mean, I um, the way I started. Uh, my paper, or the, the work I was starting with, um, the work of, of Brown's. Am I saying the same? Mm -hmm. if, I, if I say Brown, is that right? Is that, yeah, I, sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce Dutch, but um, is the sort of foundational work of his self negation, which began in the early 70s, so the time at which he began to refuse to give interviews and refused to have his work um, reproduced, and also his kind of um, 
uh, exhibition history. So when you when you look at like all he was in like six documentas, and when you look at his page in the catalog, there's nothing there. It's, he's represented by a blank page. Um, and I think we have to read that as an inquiry in like as a theorization of biography itself. And that is the work from which all of his for me, that is the work from which all of his other works flow. So we have to read this position as kind of a continuation of that work. And I think what's really interesting about um, about this film uh, is kind of like the liminal, his liminal material presence, like in the first, uh, the first scene, you can hear his breath, and then in one of the Paris street scenes, you can see his shadow. And I think consistently throughout um, his works, there's this kind of, um, like a very, li there's a, like a persistent material um, presence of his specific body, um, which is also, he's, but at the same time, he's refusing a kind of total um, image of himself or kind of total um, either discursive biographical figure or kind of literal um, figure. Um, so that's one rumination. But. Oh, I left you, yeah. Um, in my sense, uh, when we look at this image, uh, what we see is a trembling image. <coughs> so I agree with you, this, we hear the sound as a step, we hear the, the, somebody breathing, and we hear uh, so we as a city, but we are a lot about this body. And we see a trembling image, so what we are looking at is a subjective view. Mm -hmm. So I uh, agree with the fact that it's, the fact that it's not about representation of a body walking, but this is about the body walking, and we see the view of this body. So this is specifically a subjective view. And I was really struggling by that. I mean, I was thinking about Donna Haraway and the situated practice, situated practice here, because this is about technology of viewing. So this is an image of somebody looking at the, the, the streets, looking at the public space. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I'm listening. Um, I, what I um, what I felt most strongly uh, when we're talking about this film specifically. It's a space that was left for the fewer to inhabit. And um, so this, uh, I will talk from my personal, personal position. I feel because I am of that age where I remember these streets in those days. And in a sense, you're kind of like um, reliving the, the space, looking for signs. <coughs> will trigger your memory or that you're like, ah, I know this, I remember this. Um, strangely enough, Amsterdam looks extremely clean in this film. And I remember Amsterdam being a complete dirt hole in the 90s. Um, so it also challenges my, you know, my, my memory in a sense. So what I, what I find most, what strikes me best is this space that can be inhabited by me as a viewer. And of course now we have, you know, we have our mobile phones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're more used to this. Um, but maybe we could talk about the difference in technology mm -hmm. and how this difference in technology then um, basically constructs a new, a different sort of subjectivity. Yeah. I mean, I can kind of add to that because one, I mean, one of the works I was going to speak about in the paper was this work called One Step from 1970, which is. Um, a black and white film and it's a street scene and it's just still for like several minutes the version I saw was silent and then it st and then it moves forward and you feel this one step but otherwise you think it's a kind of stationary or it, it is stationary up until this one so this is a kind of continuity but it's it's weird um, it's the the authorial presence is consistent between these two films but in this one it's like it was it was just interesting to see it in a, in a completely different um, filmic medium, you know, it's because it's like color and, um, you know, also he's like, like, he's moved into the position where it's moving all the time, so I don't know, but there's one thing that we think. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this question of how, when we're looking at the work, somehow we're thrown to think about the technology and to think about how we are as a viewer, mm -hmm. I mean, it does kind of raise a question, of, so I was watching, at a certain point, I started to think, well, is this artist really kind of playing playing a game with me in terms of actually is it might not be a human body? I mean, it might actually be a machine a machine 
carrying machines, and there might be kind of extensions of a machinic presence. And there's only one, I'm not sure if we saw it in the actual clip here, but there was one, the shot where you see a shadow, which is the outline, the top of the shadow, which I thought, well, that's been thrown in just to kind of throw off that particular question. So I didn't, wasn't sure whether the artists themselves had, had thought about that. Charles, I know that you made a work um, some time ago. Yes, I believe my first year in undergraduate art school. I was living in London. And I believe we were speaking about the Flaneur back then. And it was on, a, a, what's the street called? Brick, Brick Lane around Brick Lane where I made this work where I actually counted my 1511 steps uh, that I had to make, I believe, towards the, towards the subway station or something. Anyhow, I recorded it, uh, I played it for the tutors and they were like, yeah, well, whatever, so, and then it went into the, into the files, but it's a CD and I, so, as I was watching this film, I was wondering, this idea of the flaneur, of course. Mm -hmm. But then again, I was wondering how many people have actually counted their steps. Mm -hmm. Because this idea of counting your steps is, um, before we had the counters, of course, you know, you have, this, you have an idea of distance, but you don't know how much steps you're actually taking. Yeah. And this concept, because from here to there, that's a lot of steps from here to this door, if you haven't done it, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. If you actually counted them. Um, you know, so I was just wondering how many other artists have played with this idea and uh, and executed it in one way or, or another. Mm -hmm. It was just a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that one of the things is picking up on the point about the step as measurement. Mm -hmm. You know, the sense that you know, certainly in it's called imperial measure, in imperial standards. You know, the sense of the the, the, the hand as a, as a measurement. Or, mm -hmm. Such like the, the step as a measure, and we talked about that. I know this, these other works, which kind of bring the step into a, a system, if you like, of, of measuring. And I know, so if you're interested in a work, one step, one meter, one step, one foot, one. Well, yeah. Uh, um, well, first I have to say well, that we we discussed this work uh, with Charles during a seminar uh, a few months ago. Yeah, to stay. And the study link with uh, also Nick, which is, yeah, yeah. Could, <laughs> and Bart Rutten. And the reason why I picked up this work, this specific work, is that it was about aluminium. It was a physical piece, kind of uh, what we could rely on. Well, how put this? This is a series of square, uh, <coughs> aluminium square of different size. And so the size. Um, a meter, a step, um, a foot, and an L lying on the table. And uh, usually this work is set on in this way where there is a, 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 the same amount of millimeter in between the different um, aluminum sheets. So I was very interested in this work because uh, it's not about the abstract uh, relationship between a measurement and the distance, but this is a physical piece. And we were, when we were discussing this work, we realized, I think it's you, you, you bent over the sheets of aluminum, and we discovered a signature on these sheets of aluminum. So first of all, we couldn't, our body couldn't reflect in these sheets of aluminum, so it wasn't a mirror, it was a blurring surface, but also there were a signature here in these sheets of paper, which was very confusing for us because it was manual signatures. So it was very strange to see and to, answer, and to question why Stanley Brown asked to do his manual signature on the surface. But it wasn't the step. No, it was a manual yeah, signature. Wow. <laughs> which is a quite, uh, which, which is a way to bring this uh, sheets back to another type of work, a two-dimensional work, mm. like a piece of work that could be presented in that way. So it was a very interesting moment. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess he's always kind of like displayed things off of ship in a certain way. Like, I think this, uh, like I'm thinking of the first work that I've ever seen, but I like in doing this research, I found described quite a few times, which was that like the first work he's made in the, in the sort of conceptualist vein, if you want to call it that, because he destroyed all his work uh, before the 1960s, if I understand it 
understand that correctly. Um, but he made this work where he put like paper down on the street and bicycles and cars made marks on made mark on, made made marks on it, and then that was kind of led into this way Brown, but this way Brown, which is these. Uh, this participatory work where he asked people to give him directions, but then he would stamp it. So there's this way, I mean, I was thinking about that work as like, um, uh, how do I put it? Like as a kind of, um, he's kind of recording someone's personal experience of the city or personal experience of like memory of space and then is taking that away from them, is claiming that it's his own authorship, but in a way it kind of takes the sit, like the space away from everyone. It kind of is like a, an authorial gesture that negates the possibility of authorship at all. So I think there's a way that that connects to, like, that's why I was asking if it was the stamp, because in this way Ronald is a, is a stamp. Um, but it is interesting that in the case of this kind of, um, this other kind of material, he's, Choosing to, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there are questions on there that are put with the work in relation to the nature of the artistic signature. I mean, this is mm -hmm. kind of part of the whole question, and I'm not sure whether I haven't seen that work that you're talking about, but I'm not sure whether that in itself mm -hmm. is part of part of the part of the game. And one of the things that I know that we've we spoken about and we're interested in is in relation to some of the questions that were coming from uh, the discussion this morning mm -hmm. about how the museum <coughs> relates to. Um, an, an artist whose work has worked against a signature. Mm -hmm. So, and how critics and criticism and how the art world itself can respond to an artist's work whose works against a signature. Yeah. And whether that we can actually uh, imagine for how long, a, a, a strategy that has been quite effective, for how long that might be able to last before the critics and the art historians and the journalists and the writers start to try to produce a different kind of figure, a different kind of image of, of the artist. Um, <laughs> as we were preparing for this conference, uh, you know, we did the research. We did. We had a seminar at Stadium, or what was it? Was it a seminar? Yeah, a seminar at Stadium, where we looked at the work and tried to think through the work rather than through uh, Stanley Brown's, Brown's autobiography. Mm -hmm. And we were coming up to this day, obviously. Um, and that put us in a bit of a pickle, because he uh, deceased in May, uh, last May, where at least I felt <coughs> a bit conflicted in, um, how do you say it? If this was his strategy, to not be you know, discussed personally. So let's put, I was sitting at my mom's. I was like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> and my mom was like, well, at least be respectful and take uh, the, the, the mourning period of a year, you know, respect at least the mourning period of a year before you even, you know. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it's very, um, because as an as a art historian, as a curator, you know, as a thinker, you're trying to be respectful to the tradition that the artist is basically setting out. I think he is setting out an extremely large challenge for all of us, which is also part of this uh, Black Arts and Modernism uh, project. He's basically dictating the rules through which we could possibly work through Black Arts and Modernism. Uh, so, it is challenging for me, at least, and I think possibly also for you, to keep... Maybe it would be interesting to try and find out what are the rules. What are the rules that he's laying out, mm -hmm. right? And use that as a methodology towards, you know, uh, thinking other art pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's many, many, many things here. The first question is, um, we know that uh, Stanley Brown didn't want um, anybody to speak through his biography, but does it mean that he didn't want anybody to speak of his work at all? And there's many, many frameworks to address his work, so what are the other ways to address his work? And during the seminar, we, we tried several, and it was funny because we discussed either, um, a genealogy, uh, so we use a, 
uh, this can be linked to or affiliated with, so that was a lot of male practitioners, I have to say, whether it was Richard Long, no, it's yeah. I mean, because it's so, it's so, um, in our head, the canon is so into our head, so we were referring to a lot of um, male practitioners, so it was also about um, situating the artist as a, as if it was using, as if it was a blocker, so somebody yeah. opening up something, so in my mind it was the artist as a genius something, or the really romantic ideas, or maybe you, you can contest this, I mean, no, just translating true. what I remember. We were discussing many ways to discuss the work through um, different frameworks we have. We have learned to we've learned to address the work through different frameworks. Even if we were not speaking about the biography, we were trying different angles. <coughs> so we address as well the the art is at the trickster. So it was not about the biography. So are we allowed to do that? I mean, we should, yeah, maybe we shouldn't. Well, here, here is, here is the question because we, in our pre-talk we had this discussion, we had this talk about, uh, you know, frameworks and that it seems inevitable to, because the moment you start speaking you're already putting a framework on it, right? Um, but I'm still just wondering again, would it be worth it to actually examine the framework that Stanley Brown himself set up? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He had this really great quote that I found from him after like a lot of like looking for any trace of his, like his voice um, that I think was I think was done in 2005 for an I mean it was an ex it was through an exhibition at MACBA, the 2005 exhibition at MACBA, and I think they interviewed, I think this was from an interview they did with him, but he said, biography is dead wood, the work itself produces the interviews, writes the biography, <coughs> this attitude is material, which he likened to display, he also talked about display as material, so I think we can understand his, like, um, negation of his self, or negation of biography as, like, like display and like material for him, and also he said, each millimeter meter and distance has its own identity. And that I was really like fascinated by because he was like falling, it was like he was displacing or placing identity in these kind of um, universal increments that he was utilizing or something. Like he was falling into the work as he collapsed out of it or something. So I, um, I think there is definitely like a theory of there's like a deep theory of, of kind of a biography and of identity at play here. Um, but I don't know, but like his terms as stated are kind of just like only talk about the sort of like increments that I've given you. Like speak within this frame, I think, would be my understanding of his, um, of his program. But within this quote, it's kind of like, these, this is my identity. Like, Within within these parameters, within within these gestures that I've set out, that's it. That's all there is. Um, so he's kind of like. Um, and we were also talking before this about like what we mean by formalism, which for me is kind of like something that this conference could potentially deeply complicate. Like if we're trying to really just start from the work, like what do we even mean by formalism? Seems to be like a really important um, task for this conference. Um, but I think he's saying that, I mean, in this quote, he's kind of saying that his materials or the formal instruments that he's using are the child's <coughs> identity. So I don't, yeah, I don't know what you want to do with that. Well, that's, that made me, uh, <laughs> during our uh, <coughs> seminar, I tried to do a reading <laughs> through um, afro Surinamese metaphysics, <laughs> where, uh, you know, I speak about it in my work where space is a subjectivity, right? Where the space itself is a subjectivity that you need to uh, approach carefully mm -hmm. because once you approach it, you and the space be go into an interaction and this interaction produces something, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the thread we try to follow also then, uh, uh, but that kind of makes it slightly problematic because once you go into non-Western um, metaphysical frameworks, 
immediately it is, how do you say it, you have to be extremely careful not to use the word um, magic or, um, how do I say it? or enchantment or anything, because otherwise then immediately you get this, um, this connection, which this is not what I was trying to look for. What I was trying to look for is a different way of understanding space, mm -hmm. or a different way of understanding when he says every millimeter has its own identity. From an afro Sudanese perspective, I get that, you know. So how then do I explain that, a concept like that, to uh, in a Western academic Framework, right? Mm -hmm. it, that becomes that is extremely uh, challenging. Something that I might do later when I grow up. Something that we came up earlier in conversation when people talk about this question about translation, translation, and roughness of translation, things uh, being lost but also gained in in the translation, in the translation of terms. Um, I think I may be going to questions uh, in a moment because I think that you've got enough. We've had enough material, I think. But I'm wondering if this <coughs> final, um, this piece of investigation that you've done uh, was then, in terms of locating that, that trace, trace of the voice, yeah. where there is, the, in there is a parallel challenge of return to the work. Because mm -hmm. in looking at the work, and looking at the material and the uh, finitude, the measurements, actually there's a great deal there that is yeah. yet to be excavated. Mm -hmm. uh, so perhaps we don't need to be searching for biographical detail, etc. if we spend that time investigating mm -hmm. what actually is right in front of us, what's, what's mm -hmm. being presented. So with that, I'm going to hopefully elegantly segue into asking what, about what you actually saw, um, which, is the, which was part of uh, what we wanted to do here, not just to talk about what we saw, what we think, but what, what you saw not well, just to clarify one thing. I, I wasn't looking for like biographical detail necessarily. I was trying to look for like um, his sort of statement of strategy about his like negational program. So I was looking exactly for that kind of statement about like what um, what that what the sort of foundational um, around nineteen seventy work of removing himself, what that program entailed for him. And that was kind of one of the only statements that I found about that. But you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, it's like, why was I looking for a statement? What, you know, what is the discursive? Am I overly discursively producing that work? But anyway, yeah. I've got one, two, three questions. I'll just go in order of, of appearance. It's kind of popcorn. I mean, it was popular. So one, two, three, and then four. So, um, and then we're done. <laughs> Hi, thank you for that, um, for that discussion. Um, I happened to be in here in the space while the, the entire film was, was, was playing, and I've written about three pages worth of what I've seen and what I'm kind of what sense I'm making of, uh, of, of, of this particular piece of work. And I, I, I just wondered whether it's possible to just relay some of that. Um, yes, please. So um, I suppose for me, the first thing that I was noticing was the way in which the camera is being used. And not, not just the way it's being used, but the way in which there are other kinds of associations with the camera being used in that way. So for me, it, it spoke to a very televisual kind of language, um, which kind of took me on a, a kind of another kind of trail, which um, started to think about reportage and the ways in which uh, when one sees news reports where the camera is moving that way, it's often in a space of siege somehow or, or, or some kind of embattlement, which seemed to me to be really at odds with the very mundane everydayness of the actual scenario. So I started to kind of go along on that trail and wonder <coughs> what that means to, to constantly have us um, adjusting our eyes constantly in that sort of space. May I, may I respond to that very quickly? Yeah, please uh, do. It's, uh, what I found uh, to, in relation to what you're saying is the 88, 89, that moment, that just before moment, that just, so, makes sense what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, just to add to, to that, first it's a very European piece because all the cities yeah. are based in Europe, well, and yeah. also, we, maybe if you have been here for 40 minutes, 
uh, you can see how hard it is to look at it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. You can look at it a few minutes, but yeah. after a while it's becoming very impossible. I mean, you have a headache, so it means something not to be able to look at someone's looking at something else. I mean, it, it means something, I mean, at least for me, <laughs> to be unable to look at it too, for, so, yeah, for 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Can we go and maybe come back to yes, you for some, <coughs> some, some <coughs> more? Who's um, next? I'm being uh, the same here, just being yeah. trained with the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I also really appreciated the challenge of speaking in, uh, with the work and uh, thinking with you about this. And uh, doing that made me realize what a pity it was that we didn't have the paper on the death of the author at the very beginning of the conference, because um, it, uh, the biography being dead would <laughs> responds, I suppose, to Roland Barthes' 1967 piece, which he wrote in response to Brian O'Doherty's commission, um, which uh, brings up a few challenges for us. I mean, um, um, he is enabling all the people around him to see him when he films, but he is not enabling us to see him, and also when we see the work, he's not enabling us to walk. and. Um, uh, all of those kinds of things, we're being stifled, we're not allowed to see the work in um, you know, full color, um, not moving around, so we can't make as much sense of the, the world around him as he uh, potentially <coughs> could without having um, you know, the camera to look through. Um, so it, it might speak to the difficulties that the death of the author theory brought with it for say, women and people of color at that very time when they wanted to voice what their biographies were, what their experiences were, and were being told, no, the biography is dead wood. Mm -hmm. um, so, and yet I think Brown does yet another thing and um, uh, spins it another little bit further um, beyond even us perceiving uh, a kind of a generic, universal human being. Um, it's not just the very clearly identified uh, hundred steps or thousand steps which give the impression of being very well measured and so on, but he's also making us see the failings. Um, it's not just the sort of a generic hobbling of the camera. In the last piece before Nick turned it off, I thought, um, I, I sensed he was limping. Um, there was something more human going on. And also, he's not entitling it a uh, hundred steps or a thousand steps, he's saying the 5,026th step to whatever. So we know what the time of day is. We know that he's done a, quite a bit of walking already on that day. Um, with my step uh, <laughs> counter on my Four. wrist, I know that this is uh, more than I do on a normal sedentary job sort of a day. So he's, he was doing pretty well, um, and it's uh, light and all of that we can see what, when in the day it is and so on, apart from being very specific about the location. So I think it's, a, it's even adding more detail um, that, that we can identify with without recourse to his biography. In which case we'll go back to where to be collecting these comments and observations. I think there's one here and then one at the back of the desk. I'll just say that to respond Sorry. to your comment. It is interesting to think about it in terms of like, um, like what other vision of the personal is political does this offer? You know, because he has these other works where he'll measure, like he has these other works that are like one step equals this specific, one step, his step, one step, his body mm -hmm. equals this many millimeters, mm -hmm. you know, so there's this kind of like <coughs> insertion of a very individual body mm -hmm. in relationship to like bureaucratic systems. So yeah, I mean, it's a very different vision of mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then if you could pass it back. You're going to read the pitch then. After I finish? Yes, please. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's politeness, it's not a protect situation. Please go ahead. Um, 
by quoting you, David, I wanted to speak directly uh, from the word, uh, by what we are looking at now, um, giving us the details of the artist, the title, and specific uh, times, locations, um, as punctums, as well as um, the number of steps, as suggested perhaps relating to uh, the geographicality of steps between two different locations. Um, but I'm also, by looking at this, I'm visualizing it as gaps between the visuals, between the recorded um, uh, videos. Um, hence, by presenting us with these, which we may refer to as subtitles or headings, or in my point of view as gaps, black and white gaps, between the recorded videos and in conjunction with the distorted visuals <coughs> coming from a deliberate usage of a handheld camera presenting us with challenging visions in relation to the rhythms coming from steps or arrhythmia because they're not rhythmic so-called so I'm just wondering whether <coughs> by referring to the steps as geographical steps between two topographical points, or are we envisaging arrhythmia through dislocation, mislocation, hence the evacuation of the artist, or the misplacement of the artist, or the deliberate misplacement of the artist between these you know, locations? Yeah, my question is, and I ask, and this is my question, arrhythmia in relation to the gaps in conjunction with sort of, you know, BAM and the whole notion of, you know, the artists of being evacuated. Thank you. I'm so excited by everything that's being said that I just wanted, we could all write a paper and put them together in this one piece. Thank you. We, we will hold that question and I don't know if some, if, um, so that we can collect some more comments and maybe there might be some threads going, going through it. I mean, certainly, <coughs> Uh, I think this question about evacuation death of the author, the, uh, the artist, disappearing perhaps in the gaps between the steps, maybe this is something that's, that we can pick up. Would you like, do you have the answer? Yeah. Would you like to go ahead? Um, so I'm uh, just wondering, listening to you, it, it was a very interesting uh, discussion, but uh, you used the term of flaneur and flannery, and um, in my point of view, for example, uh, uh, the Flannery experience is a very male or dominant experience of the public space. I mean, um, where you're in the street, you're not necessarily in a safe space. And so I think it's also um, maybe interesting you, you, you talk about uh, the trembling image or what, what it is to count uh, one step. And maybe for me, um, the image or what we see is much more talking about being vulnerable in the public space, and so I was just wondering why uh, you you were talking about flanning. Is that not a, you know just a wondering? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a good point. I mean, maybe I'll, I'll respond to that just very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then I know there was some back here as well. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 we had the, uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. I think that came uh, partly through two things. First of all, I take on the point about the planner as this dominant figure, this, this, this male occupation of the, of the urban space. Which, and what I thought was interesting was that it was precisely working against that. So in a way, it's a kind of counter flannery, because in a sense, as I mainly, you know, just on that first viewing, these, these particular places in these, these uh, urban settings one would suggest that there was this male figure wandering the streets, etc. But there's a refusal of that, a kind of a, a, a countering of that. And that's what I found to be very interesting. And the only way in which there was a, a sense of the occupation of the space was in two ways. First of all, through a shadow, and then secondly, through the sound of the steps. And I thought that one of the things that was happening in, in the reading of the text was I was being forced away from this visual inhabitation <coughs> of the space to listening. <coughs> And in a way that I got away from actually not being able to look at that thing for 40 minutes was I started to count the steps myself. Because mm -hmm. uh, I thought there was a there was, by counting the 50,000, blah, 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 and there's 100 steps in each one. And I thought, well, are there really 100 steps? So eventually, I, was, I wasn't really looking at it at all. I was listening to it. 
And I thought that that might be also part of the, the device, to force me away from this kind of visual dominance of the space into all these understated ways in which we, one can get traces. So that, that's about what I was about. I think it's a really important point. Can I, can I just yeah, add sorry. something to it? Um, I think it's what has been said here but by several people is very, very interesting and it makes me think how we can compare this very unsettled work, I mean, not other work, but um, image with the rest of the work, all the kind of work. I'm, I'm thinking of um, all the work, very clean work, really white and black and really precise work uh, that everyone has been doing, first of all. And second, I'm thinking of the series of um, editions or book, book artist books that uh, Stanley has been doing with uh, all, as well this uh, ambiguity in the status of the work. So we, we never know if it's a, an artwork or a, a book that we can buy from the library. And I know that some uh, in some museums there is a doubt of where to situate the work. And also what represents the white space in those pages is that a space we can invest, as a, we can write on it, or are we not allowed to? And there's also as well this ambiguity in how we, can we situate ourselves with this work? Can we look at it? Can, or, um, is, it is that forbidden or just not impossible? Or, and I think looking at Stanley's work, Stanley Brown's work in general, there's um, every time this question of uh, opening, closing doors, opening, closing doors. And in any way, saying earlier, this relationship between universal and individual space, and this, again, this ambiguity of ways to, to go and go against this, the, the idea, which I find really interesting to, to bring all together as a way to see this work. Well. Yeah, just before we go on, I've just got to be mindful that we've got about 10 minutes left, so I wanted to count see how many kind of people still wanted to speak. And I know oh, there's some, awesome. people, some people waiting for a long time. Mm -hmm. They've been waiting for a long time. You've been waiting for a long time. So is the microphone... Mm -hmm. The microphone's with that. Okay, so <laughs> one, two... Stay with yours before. So if we could have four more questions, and then that and then, then we'll close. So, so yeah, my, my, it's more of an observation, and it, it kind of picks up the thread on the planner that was referenced around public space. and I'm. Um, now, being a boring art historian and thinking about art historical referencing and remembering quite vividly a wonderful feminist art historian colleague being insistent that women can't be flannels. And she was a historian of um, sort of 19th century British <laughs> art. And women could not be uh, flannels because they could not have that agency of moving in and out of the city space in France uh, in the way that um, Baudelaire's sort of privilege, his, if we're going to talk about intersectionality, his gender, his class allowed him to have, and that Benjamin then extends to that sense of what modernity is, that you're inside and outside a particular group, and you are able to understand them because of that. So if we then extend that logic of this sort of insistence by feminists that women cannot be flanners, can black men not be flanners? Is there the same kind of problem of an uh, African man in uh, a European city walking through it, who, if I'm thinking also now of Lubaina Hamid's very striking re relation, relating of her experiences of being uh, in Britain in the 80s, she was very visible on the street and invisible uh, in the media. And so I'm wondering about that sense of whether when you're walking, a particular subject position we're talking about, walking through the streets is hyper-visible, uh, can there be a flaneur? Uh, because uh, are they able to slip in and out? Um, and I'm now suggesting a dialectical engagement with what's outside of the screen and what's inside the screen. Okay. Great, thank you very much. I think what we'll do is we'll just collect the questions and take some final comments <coughs> on the panel just to, to help us with the time. So we did have um, yeah. about the, the sound. Okay.
yeah, everyone wants. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. In terms of the questioning of art history, I wonder if uh, Brown's rejection of biography has anything to do with the founding moment of art history, which is of course the lives of artists. And I don't know if the panel could speak to his, his specific rationale for rejecting biographism. But um, in uh, Vasari, for example, there was a clear connection made between the value of the work and the biography of the artist, which was there as a pleasurable narrative to be shared and circulated among a very wide readership. <coughs> I think that's a very interesting point, but the minute someone tells me I can't do something, I want to do it, of course. So for me, Stanley Brown was always a very intriguing name I'd never investigated. So I didn't know that he was from Amsterdam, I didn't know he was black. The first minute I saw the film, I first of all thought, well, this has got nothing to do with the experience of walking down the street if you're an ordinary person with binocular vision. So I wondered if the camera was actually bouncing around on his chest. And I was very impressed by everyone's very sensitive remarks. So I'm coming, you know, I understand that this is a very delicate and important and interesting project. I also immediately thought, because it was on the French boulevard Sebastopol, that he's not using beautiful, flannerated spaces, he's using very boring streets sometimes, full of traffic. But also, I thought, at the time, you know, I'm having my slow conversion and understanding how much I preferred Eugène Kosakowski's Paris project, which seemed to me kind of sharper and more intelligent and more topographical and this, that and the other. But then, when you talked about um, Afro-Surinamese metaphysics, then I began to realize that there was more in Stanley Brown. So I just quickly discovered what I could discover about him. But I wanted to give him a word because I, um, in, in Art and Project, when he showed in Amsterdam in 1969, he did say this very metaphysical thing. Because I think that if he says something metaphysical, we don't need to be restrained to formalist responses. He said, walk during a few moments very consciously in a certain direction. Simultaneously, an infinite number of living creatures of the universe are moving in an infinite number of directions. Mm. So I just wanted him to be allowed to make his metaphysical comment. Yes, yes, please do. Mm. So, then, no, not I think we are... Lunch is not at, uh, dinner is not at seven, but at seven thirty. I'll, I'll I'll make it very brief because <laughs> my point was actually uh, has already been mentioned. Can a black man be a, a flaneur? But I would just say that I'm glad you said it was an anti-flaneur piece because the point is that a flaneur would never and could never count his steps. That would be impossible for a flaneur. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're going like to get some freedom. I'm going to just go to the final comments from the, from the table because I just want to wind up. I've got two minutes left and I would like to just have some kind of summaries if I may. There'll be lots of time in the plenary. Exactly. Lots of time. Loads. <laughs> <laughs> So can I uh, go to our final uh, comment from the, from the table? Um, we've heard a lot of uh, different uh, comments from the floor there around rejection of biographism. Um, actually, some, some points actually wanting to very specifically return to what I call the text of the, of the, of the moving image, both in terms of what we see here in, the, in these title works, but also the kinds of attention that the work demands or that the, the work actually refuses, not enabling us to actually look or force us to look in a, in a particular way. Um, these interesting questions around the flaneur and the, the, the politics, if you like, of, of, of flannery, um, but also this kind of question about the, um, the space within the, the text of the film, but also the imagining or forcing us to think about how the work was actually made 
because obviously a figure walking down the street with a camera, either holding a camera or trying to pounce on their chest, is obviously going to be hyper visible, and yet that is going to be evacuated. So, you how large, know how large are all these cameras back then? Like this? Who knows? An 89? Yeah, like I thought they were like. Anyone? Mm. Is it, are we talking this size? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. You see the shadow of the camera. Yeah. 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 It's small. It must, must be on the shoulder or something. Yeah. 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 Okay, so. I guess I could respond to, to like, the, I think the point about the sort of dialectical relation between sort of what is inside and outside the frame is somehow something he puts into play through his um, evacuation of self. Because an evacuation of self is, of course, also um, a kind of insertion of self on your own terms. So he is asking for this kind of, and I think that's a really good way of putting it. The point about Vasari is, like, really interesting because one of the comparisons I've been thinking through, although um, the point in the first panel about like the, like the kind of politics of comparison, I've really been, like Susan's point about um, this like injunction to compare, I'm kind of think, rethinking in terms of this comparison, but I've been thinking about Lee Lozano's um, boycott, uh, boycott pieces, various, the boycott women piece, but also the um, general strike piece, and how in her terms that was really a rejection of after dematerialization, um, the um, the commodification of the figure of the artist and the rejection of the rejection of that form of commodification. And I think what's interesting about this is, although Brown doesn't engage in like the kind of terminology of revolution in the way that she does, and, she, and he doesn't have like an explicit market critique that he verbalizes. <coughs> I think that by the very fact that he also it's not only like interviews or kind of biographical material that he disallows, but also um, like he refuses to have his like CV printed anywhere, um, which is cl very clearly a rejection of kind of like protocols of professionalization and the commodification of the artist. And I think also points to perhaps like the way that um, the black artist, as those two words are joined together, how that circulates within a circuit of value in relationship to artists that don't have that moniker, right? So I think he's like identifying that and refusing that kind of. Um, uh, that kind of system of value. So that's like, what I would say. Great. Thank you. So, as a res not a response, but to follow up on that, this is uh, basically exactly what my thesis is working with this paradox of, um, uh, how do you say that? The parab this par paradox of trying to speak about artists of color mm -hmm. while not naming them artists of color, <laughs> right? So, how do you then speak about the work? How do you place the work in relationship to? The rest of everything that is happening, uh, so it's you know it's but it's a tricky question and he kind of pick point, pinpointed it. Yeah. Okay, I tried to make it short. Three really really quick points. Um, first, I think it's very interesting to see that um, experiencing the work as we did here, we we can bridge this work with uh, what has been said yesterday about the kind of aesthetic of rejection. So it's a way that we cannot look at it. So we are it's another form of aesthetic projection. Second, the paradox that you've just mentioned. I should um, I just want to come back to some point that in the uh, artist book, um, in some of them, Stanley Brown has been putting his name. There's really few things in those pages, but there is a name in uh, Helvetica and, and sometimes there is Suriname. 1935, which is so really, really located. I mean, if you don't want anybody to know about where you come from, where, where, why do you put this in the book, in your, in your white page? And the last point is about um, uh, a thing you said during the seminar which I found fascinating was about how about um, thinking those artist book as instruction pieces that we should practice. Yeah, so it's another way to open up our understanding of his practice. And so it's fascinating to see how this um, work is crossing all the <coughs> art history movement of the same period, fluxes, conceptual yeah. performance, etc. There's so much in there. It's gone straight through all of it. Mm -hmm. On which note, I think we bring this to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.